So it's wonderful to be here for this annual lecture. And we are deeply honored to have Rabbi the Baroness Neuberger as our 2019 Vincent Strudwick Lecturer. Baroness Neuberger is a member of the House of Lords, where she sits on the cross benches and senior rabbi at the West London Synagogue, a position she's held since 2011. She came to prominence in Britain as the second woman to be ordained a rabbi. And that was in 1977. And I do remember that she and her Jewish sisters were an extraordinary um, sort of inspiration to those of us actually in the Christian churches who had, well, we hadn't got our act together at all for the most part. I mean, some of the nonconformists had. But in the Anglican Church, uh, 1976 was the year of uh, the foundation of the movement of the ordination of women. And we looked over and um, were deeply inspired by Rabbi Julia. So thank you for all the inspiration you've offered to all uh, women of all religious persuasions and affiliations. She was then, uh, when she was first ordained rabbi of the South London Liberal Synagogue from 77 to 1989, and gradually, well not so gradually, very quickly became one of this country's most prominent religious figures and one of our most significant and valued voices in the public sphere, publishing many books on religion and ethics, such as The Moral State We're In in 2005, appearing on BBC Radio 2's Pause for Thought, and most recently publishing Anti-Semitism, What Is It, What It Isn't, and Why It Matters, and you can buy that from Orion Books, published earlier this year. Besides being an important voice in religion and ethics in the public sphere, she also became a leader in the area of healthcare. From 92 to 97, she was chair of Camden and Islington Community Health Services, NHS Trust. And from 97 to 2004, chief executive of the King's Fund. And she has since been sought widely for her wisdom and experience to sit on numerous commissions and boards related to healthcare issues. For example, she chaired the review of the Liverpool Care Pathway for Dying Patients in 2013 and was vice chair of the Mental Health Act Independent Review from 2017 to 2018. She's currently chair of the University College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, and she just last month became the chair of Independent Age. In short, Baroness Neuberger's sense of public service has been extraordinary, and I think we will come to discuss some of that this evening, given the topic of the lecture. She's also sat on many committees, and, and when I said I'd like to mention all these committees, she said enough already. Um, but I do want you to know how much extraordinary work she does, and she's come here this evening ready to fly off to Holland tomorrow, where she's a, f a, a trustee of the Van Leer Group Foundation and chair of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. Her outstanding role, therefore, in our civic, religious, and public life makes her the perfect Vincent Strudwick lecturer because in this series, we attempt to raise important questions about religion and public life. The theme of her lecture this evening is civility in public life. She'll speak for a bit, and then we are going to open up the floor for questions and conversation. So it's a great treat to have this very distinguished public figure, enormously inspirational religious figure with us here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Baroness Neuberger. Well, thank you, Jane. That was really lovely, a um, bit over the top. Um, and I want to say how touched and honoured I am to be invited to give this lecture. Now, I don't know Vincent, but I have a very close friend in Richard Harris, Bishop Har Harris. You all know, okay, you all know Richard Harris. Okay, he's one of my closest friends. And he said that Vincent was an utterly good thing. <laughs> and if, if Richard says that Vincent's an utterly good thing, Vincent is definitely an utterly good thing. But more to the point, Vincent has made this huge contribution to how people think, particularly I think in the Anglican Church, but much more widely about these issues in, to do with religion and public life. And that's why I'm particularly touched and honoured to have been invited to give this lecture. So I'm really delighted to be with you and thank you. And thank you to Jane, who I've admired from afar, about whom Richard Harris also said that she's a very good thing. <laughs> and so, um, you know, R Richard 
said, I had to come and do this. I wasn't given any alternative, because actually the other thing about rigid, if he tells you you've got to do something, actually you do it, because it's just much easier. But I am going to talk about something that I think is serious, and that is how shocked I am, and I'm sure you all are too, at the numbers of MPs, and particularly women MPs, and it is one after another after another, who are standing down from politics and not standing at the general election next month because of the abuse and the taunting that they have received as MPs. And so the question I want to pose to you is what has become of our once tolerant, moderately easygoing, relatively polite society? I don't think I can explain, I don't think I can answer that. But instead, what I thought I would do is talk about a Jewish concept, a particularly Jewish concept called Derech Eretz, and I'll explain that in a moment, which may be one tool that we could use to counter some of this deeply depressing news about how some people are being targeted in our society. And let me also say that shocked as I am by many of these women standing down, it's nothing in comparison, what they have had is nothing in comparison to some of the material that I had to look at when working on my, on my book on anti-Semitism, which came out earlier this year, you heard about that, but where I saw some really, really disgusting comments, abuse and trolling that you would hardly have believed possible in the UK. And individuals, and especially women, and especially Jewish women, came under attack time and again. Maureen Lippmann, Margaret Hodge, Luciana Berger, Rachel Riley, Ruth Smee, and I could go on and on and on. The list goes on and it's utterly despicable and the anonymity and ease of tweeting and to some extent posting on Facebook has led to all sorts of racist, misogynist comments, anti-Semitism and the vicious trolling of a variety of people. And various quite disgraceful scenes in the House of Commons show us how serious this vile name-calling and lack of civility has become. And the fact that this behaviour is now quite commonplace amongst some of our political leaders, using some of the ab abusive terminology of the Facebook and Twitter trolls, is quite appalling. So the question to pose for tonight is, what has happened to Derech Eretz, which actually means literally the way of the earth, but it means politeness, courtesy, one of our fundamental British values, or so I thought. So I'm going to take you back to the 19th century. Back then, there was a famous rabbi in Frankfurt, which is where one part of my family originally came from, one guy called Samson Raphael Hirsch, who lived from 1808 to 1888. And he put forward this concept, which is Torah im derech Eretz, literally Torah, five books of Moses, the law, with the way of the land. Now, he was a very, very orthodox Jew. I can say more about him later if you want to know. But he formalized a relationship between traditionally observant Judaism, extremely observant Judaism, and the modern world. And that phrase, Torah im derech Eretz, is first found in the Mishnah, so back in sort of roughly 200 CE or AD, which goes, beautiful is the study of Torah with derech Eretz, as involvement with both makes one forget sin. And that means it involves earning a livelihood and behaving with good character and being serious about one's study of Torah. And there's some 200 or so teachings in rabbinic literature about derech Eretz, all talking about decent, polite, respectful, thoughtful, civilized behavior. And in one case, we're actually told that derech Eretz, behaving in a decent fashion, comes before Torah, takes precedence over the law. Unless one is courteous, one cannot fulfill the rest of the commands of Torah of God's law. And later rabbinic literature, which is known as Musar literature, I'm not going to do a short course on, on, on rabbinic Judaism because it takes a little while, um, but that presents an entire body of thought devoted to the subject of character traits and behaving like, and the Yiddish word is mensch, like a refined and decent human being. The idea is that some behaviour has to be legislated for in order for society to function. So we need, well, you might say we don't, but I think we need tax regulations. We probably need traffic rules that people seem to rejoice in breaking them. We probably need laws for bankruptcy, procedures for trial and how we run our judiciary. But those who are talking and discussing this concept 
of you know, Derek Eretz say that there are lots of things that shouldn't need to be the subject of any kind of bylaw, statute, or house rule. One of the examples that some of the people discussing this say is that uh, chewing gum doesn't, doesn't get disposed of on furniture or on the floor. You shouldn't need a rule for that, actually. In some places, I think you probably do. Uh, and another one is you shouldn't need a rule to say answering the telephone requires a pleasant manner. But also, sometimes I think perhaps you do. Um, and in a crowded car park, please park between the lines and don't go over two spaces. A bit obvious, but maybe you need to say it. Um, but anyway, in Hebrew, such basic and obvious considerations for others is called derech eretz, the way of the world, the way we ought to behave. And it's quite a slippery concept. It keeps morphing like many things. Uh, and it quite often describes ideas that you'd expect to be unspoken. You might have thought not sending vicious tweets wouldn't need to be made an explicit prohibition. Uh, the term can simply mean common decency, such as when the rabbis tell us that we ought to greet others before they greet us, or when it tells us not to enter somebody else's home abruptly, or you might say perhaps not without being invited. But what is interesting, and I know some of you are theologians here, and Jews are really rubbish at theology. So look, can I just lay that on the table? We're really rubbish. But what is interesting, insofar as we are good theologians at all, which isn't much, is unlike everything else in Judaism, this concept has no explicit theological grounding. On the surface, it's entirely about how we relate to other individuals and to society at large without any explicit reference to our relationship with God. And when we get in the Midrash, that's rabbinic sort of storytelling type of a theological explanation, when the Midrash says, um, a person should refrain from using wood from a fruit-bearing tree to build his house, and calls that a lesson in Derech Eretz, its primary concern seems to be ecological and economic. It's not based on any religious law. Or when in the Talmud, and there's actually a very short sort of Talmudic tractate about this uh, Derech Eretz behaving in a good way, it says, don't rejoice among people who are weeping, nor weep among people who are rejoicing. Well, it's a bit obvious in a way, but it's apparently teaching us to be sensitive to the feelings of others and to care for our own reputations as well. And unlike most other things, it isn't based straightforwardly on a biblical verse, which is how you would expect it to be. Now, you could have done that. You could have presented it in terms of theological concepts, creation as divine trust in human hands, or human beings as reflections of the divine image, but that isn't how it's done. It's just self-evident. There's no need to trace it back to first principles. Very unusual in Judaism. So there you are. There's the concept. I think we need to introduce it into society as a whole, or perhaps reintroduce it, I should say. But I would ask, because that's the subject for tonight, what has happened to Derech Eretz, politeness and courtesy in our public life? And what should we do about it? Well, Paul Bew, who chairs the Committee on Standards in Public Life, has argued that the wave of intimidation and abuse directed at parliamentary candidates has taken British politics to a tipping point and risks driving politicians out of public life in the future. And we've seen that happening. And at this election, he, has, he hasn't said anything, obviously, now nah, because we're in an election period. I have to be careful what I say. We're in what's called PERDA. Uh, but at this election, I think it's been more apparent than we've ever seen before. And he said that he might recommend new legislation to combat this issue. But I don't think myself on the whole, that this is really about law. And even if it were, it would take far more than legislation to change this habit of vicious attack and trolling. And a debate on the subject um, in 2017 in Westminster Hall brought this to life. MP after MP outlined their experience of such behavior, including racism, anti-Semitism, and death threats. And Paul Bew said, we're in a bad moment and we have to respond to it. We cannot afford to lose people of quality in our public life, and we may be approaching this tipping point. And then he said, above all, we do need leadership from Parliament itself on this point. We've reached a point where this is not a sermon. This has got to be treated with some sharpness. Read Nicky Morgan, Jess Phillips, Luciana Berger, and in the, in the Times on November the 2nd and 9th, so this month, 
and you'd be forgiven for thinking the public is simply not reacting sufficiently when we're in an election campaign, and you'd have thought that people could make their voices heard about this, about this and actually much more. Many MPs, possibly the majority, have already improved their security arrangements since Labour MP Joe Cox was murdered by a right-wing extremist in 2016. But a large number then complained about a new level of harassment in the run-up to the 8th of June 2017 vote. That was then. We're two years on, and it seems to have got worse. Simon Hart, the Conservative MP who called that Westminster Hall debate, said that the Tory Whip's office has been, been dealing with at least three credible threats to colleagues every week, including death threats, criminal damage, sexism, racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, anti and general thuggishness around and indeed after the 2017 election, and it hasn't stopped. And he had always considered elections to be a few weeks of robust banter, followed by the shake of the hand and a pint in the pub. I don't know about anybody else. I used to, used to really enjoy elections, but I'm not enjoying this one very much. And he said he felt like that in 2010, but that when it got to 2017, he thought that it was characterised by swastikas on election boards, offensive slogans and language, offensive language on posters. And if you think he's had a rough time, and he has, Diane Abbott, the Shadow Home Secretary, with whom I disagree on most things, told the debate that she had suffered uh, racist abuse over and over again, every day, both on and offline. And she, I, I quote her, we're talking about mindless abuse, and in my case, the mindless abuse has been characteristically racist and sexist. And just to outline, I've had death threats, I've had people tweeting that I should be hung if they could find a tree big enough to take the fat bitch's weight. Now, she's spoken out about this, good for her, and she's spoken about how she deals with the online vitriol after a growing number of female MPs had announced that they weren't going to stand in this general election. And they have been citing the abuse they face in public office. She was actually found in a study to be subject to nearly half the abusive tweets sent to all female MPs. And she says she copes with it by putting one foot in front of the other. Now, she wants social media companies to re record the real identities of people using their platforms in order to tackle the problem. And she's right. But that's only one thing, only one bit of remedy amongst something, in my view, much bigger. And she was talking about this after Cabinet Minister Nikki Morgan said she wouldn't be standing as a cabinet, with one of her reasons being the abuse she'd received, and talking about the impact that it had had on her family. And former Home Secretary Amber Rudd, another one, said she wouldn't fight because of the abuse she's received. And then Heidi Allen, the, conservative, the former Conservative MP who defected to the Liberal Democrats via Change UK, so she's been through a lot of parties. She also said she wouldn't stand, highlighting, and I quote, the nastiness and intimidation that has become commonplace. She'd suffered utterly dehumanising abuse and was exhausted by the nastiness and intimidation she'd faced. And then she continues, of course public scrutiny is to be expected, but lines are all too often regularly crossed and the effect is utterly dehumanising. And in August, a man was jailed for 24 weeks after he sent menacing tweets and a Facebook post to Ms. Allen. Diane Abbott's talked about this. Lots of people have talked about this. Diane wants Twitter and Facebook and any online platform to have people's real names and addresses. She thinks you'd be able to crack down on it if that were what was required. I think we need to do more than that. And my own view is we probably need to do more than the, the platforms themselves having people's names and addresses. I think we have to stop the anonymity. I think people have to give their names. If you're not brave enough to give your name, shut up. So I feel quite strongly about this. You just may have noticed. Um, MPs have talked to the BBC about this, including being sent pictures of decapitated bodies, being filmed surreptitiously, usually embarrassingly, and having dog mess smeared on their front doors. And uh, an SNP uh, MP, Lisa Cameron, has had to put extra security in place so that her children can play safely in her back garden. And it goes on and on and on, and it's not just MPs. Businesswoman Gina Miller, the campaigner against Brexit, has been vilified. She now has 24-7 security. 
She doesn't even get public funds for that, which the MPs do. And she's been targeted with absolutely appalling abuse. Roderick Colwyn Phillips, who's the fourth Viscount St David's, you might think he should know better, published a post uh, about her on Facebook in 2016, which said, £5,000 for the first person to accidentally run over this bloody troublesome first-generation immigrant. Four days after, she'd won a Brexit legal challenge against the government. And Chief Magistrate Emma Arbuthnot said she had no doubt it was, mem um, it was menacing. The levels of abuse fluctuate over time. Spikes are driven by events. For example, the death of Shamima Begum, the, I uh, the IS bride, but death of her baby, key events in Brexit negotiations. Interestingly, Tory MPs receive more abuse than Labour ones on the whole. Sexist abuse is the worst, most prevalent, as compared with homophobia or racism. And John Mann, who was talking about a nail bomb threat made to his office, and he said in any other profession, uh, an HR team would be in complete meltdown with some of this stuff. And you know, various of the Tory MPs have talked about how they've had to have extra protection, um, and extra protection not only around their homes, but also around their cars. So we're getting to some of the stuff. Do you remember when people were worried about IRA attacks on cars? And we're getting back to that with MPs having to sweep under their cars to check that nothing is uh, there that might cause a threat. And Met Police Commissioner Cressida Dick has told a Commons committee that threats to MPs are at unprecedented levels and the number of crimes more than doubled in 2018. And it's just going on and on and on. And I'm particularly worried about Margaret Hodge, who has become a good friend of mine. She's quite interesting in, in all sorts of ways, and perhaps we could talk about that later. But um, she has had, perhaps of all of the Labour women MPs, the worst of the anti-Semitism. And it's really been completely, um, it's been completely appalling. I mean, she's quite funny about it because I'm glad she can be amused. I mean, she's quite clear, you know, her family tried to make her a Jew, the rabbis tried to make her a Jew, Corbyn has made her a Jew. And uh, she's, she's quite clear about that. But she has had an absolute base and fall. She lost her voice for nearly six months as a result of the extremity of the abuse that she was receiving uh, at the end, back end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018. And she has taken on Corbyn on anti-Semitism, and that's been absolutely ghastly. She's um, condemned the reinstatement to Labour. He's now gone again of Chris Williamson. And she's called for an independent system uh, to handle anti-Semitism disciplinary proceedings in the Labour Party because she's quite clear that political interference has corrupted the current system. Uh, and in just in September, a couple of months ago, she did say, after I, I can't tell you what it's been like, and I've seen a lot of the, the tweets that she's received, um, she said, I'm not going to give up until Jeremy Corbyn ceases to be leader of the Labour Party. And in October, she saw off an attempt by Corbyn supporters to deselect her, so good for her. And um, she was threatened with disciplinary action for accusing Corbyn um, of not dealing with anti-Semitism. And she's been really quite moving in her response about that. She said, on the day that I heard they were going to discipline me and possibly suspend me, it felt like almost, I kept thinking, what did it feel like to be a Jew in Germany in the 30s? Because it felt almost as if they were coming for me. Now, she's quite clear, obviously, it's not in the same league, but it was, it was, she felt very personally under attack. And she talked about her father, who left Germany in the 1930s uh, to run a family firm headquartered in Egypt before they all came to London in 1948. It reminded me what my dad always said to me as a child. You've got to keep a packed suitcase at the door, Margaret, in case you ever have got to leave in a hurry. And she said she has felt that since all of this started in the Labour Party. And she just feels that, you know, it's abuse, it's trolling, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's the odd swastika being daubed on things. But, you know, words can lead to worse. And she finds it very frightening. And she's been, she's taken them on. She's not a wimp. And she hasn't left. But she feels that the level of abuse and the fact that nobody really slaps it down is quite terrifying. 
And I'm just quoting her here. Corbyn supporters tell me I financed the murder of innocent children and should slit my own wrists. One Corbyn fanatic even said that it should have been me, not Joe Cox, who was murdered three years ago. On a bad day, I despair. But more often, I remind myself that the Labour Party is almost 120 years old and has achieved so much. So if you check out Google and Facebook and Twitter, I don't know whether that's a real pleasure for anybody, but if you do, um, you can look at the level of abuse. I mean, you can qu a lot of it is absolutely freely available. You don't need to be able to get into somebody's account. You don't need to be somebody's follower on Twitter. You can just see it. And it's absolutely vile. Type in the name of any MP and you will see it. And if it's a woman, it's very often misogynist. If it's a man, it's usually having a real go at whichever party they represent. But quite often, it's quite racist. Uh, it's very often homophobic and it's frequently anti-Semitic. It's quite often anti-Semitic against people who aren't even Jewish, which seems a bit hard, really, but still. Um, and also, there's a huge amount, it seems so bizarre, but there's a huge amount of white supremacist stuff out there, quite a lot of which is, again, targeted at a lot of our MPs. I mean, us in the House of Lords, we're too old, we don't get all this stuff. But the ones in, in the Commons, they get a lot of this white supremacist stuff. Uh, often claiming Christian hegemony. I think that's actually quite important to say in this particular audience. Um, there are quite a lot who say that, uh, and, and this is what the, the Jewish MPs get, Jews are not proper Brits, uh, and that there's a real-world Jewish conspiracy. And it isn't just absurd. That's the problem with it. I, I, you know, up to about 2016, I just used to say, this is rubbish, you know, let's just ignore it. This is just people being ridiculous. It's become so intense and we've seen the murder of Joe Cox. And you see that the way that people speak to each other has changed, and that people do not observe the common courtesies in the same way. So <coughs> I think that incivility can lead to much, much worse. It's leading, I would argue, to outright racism. It's possibly leading to violence, certainly in a few instances. And it's leading to the loss of any semblance of tolerance. I think if you scan Twitter, it's probably worse on Twitter than Facebook or anywhere else. Uh, Danny Finkelstein, the journalist, Daniel Finkelstein, wrote um, back in April 2016 when, when, when it felt like the mood changed. Let me give you some of the examples of tweets sent to me with my name tagged in the last two days. His, uh, he gets particularly Holocaust denial because his grandfather set up the Wiener Library, which uh, keeps the records of as many uh, pieces of evidence of what happened to people during the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a lie. Hitler was right. The Holocaust is a complete fake. What Holocaust? Holocaust. Count up the deaths throughout the Middle East and then talk to me about Holocaust mates. Finkelstein, what a wonderful traditional English name. As I say, that's just the last two days. Some of the people tweeting this sort of stuff have a handful of followers, but many have hundreds, and some have thousands. One particularly obnoxious individual, Charles Frith, who spreads Holocaust, or as he calls it, hollow hoax denial, has tens of thousands of readers. His, speciali his particular speciality is linking child abuse, mad anti-Zionist nonsense, and Holocaust denial in a constant stream. And we see this. Look at Twitter. It's there all the time. Or take what happened to Rachel Riley, presenter on Countdown on Channel 4, who took a brave and public aim at the anti-Semites supporting Labour. I quote, In the name of Labour, I've been called a hypocrite, lying propagandist, teeth, tits and arse, clothes horse dolly bird, weaponizer of anti-Semitism, fascist, right-wing extremist, Nazi sympathizer, Twitter cancer, thick, Tory, brainwashed, an anti-Semite, white supremacist, a zio-political trollster, not a real Jew, a child bully, bonkers mad conspiracy theorist, a pedo-protector minion puppet whom my dead grandfather would be disgusted by. And after I used the recent anniversary of my 10 years as Countdown's numbers lady as an opportunity to give this topic a bigger platform with an on-camera interview, an 11,500-word article was written with the sole intention of discrediting 
many brave and dedicated people standing up to anti-Semitism. I can only describe this article as A-grade conspiracy garbage, complete with go-to clips, neo-Nazi-like, to use to prove that anti-Semitism's just a trick. A quarter of the article was about me, including how I'm anti-Semitic and should be fired. You may remember some of this. It made national news. And Riley received enormous support from her Twitter followers and the wider world. I and mean, there is some comfort in this. Most people think this is all disgusting. But it does give you a flavour of what's going on. And it seems to me that all these cases, one after another after another, show us that something serious is going on and that as a civilised society we need to do something about it. We cannot tolerate, surely, a situation where MPs are leaving in significant numbers, especially the women, because of the abuse that they are encountering. Labour women MPs and Conservatives can be branded traitors and attacked for no good reason, as if there could be a good reason. And we need to examine our political and other discourse and see whether we need to regulate it with laws or whether entreaty and standard setting will be enough. But this is the heart of the problem. And apart from recommending regulation of social media, which I would do, no other solution is a quick fix. We have to work out a really new way of thinking about how we run our political and public life. So you've got anti-Semitism, particularly targeted at women being on the increase. Trolling of individuals is on the increase. The use of Twitter particularly to abuse and attack is on the increase. The question in all this vileness, rudeness, misogyny and hate is how do we stop it? How do we put it back in the box and recreate civility? I think it needs a sustained public and political effort a movement of people who say that they will not and cannot tolerate this. But who leads it and how isn't yet clear. This matters. It ought to be meat and drink during this election campaign, but it isn't. I would argue that people who are appalled by this across the political spectrum need to get together and campaign about this and get some legislation on the statute book on regulation of social media. But that would only be the beginning. The rest is a test of how we all behave and calling out incivility, rudeness, attacks and vile behaviours wherever they occur. So I would argue that this ought to be a lesson in Derech Eretz, Torah in Derech Eretz, following God's law along with common courtesy, that that is what we need and therefore, I would argue that all of us in this room and all of us who are interested in standards in public life and the lessons that religion may be able to give to public life need to set up a serious campaign on this issue. Because I think unless we do, this isn't going to go away. It's going to get worse. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Julia, for that very uh, important uh, um, talk about a very, very serious issue. Um, I think we're going to open it up shortly, so please do think of your questions. I'm going to start by asking you a question really about whether you want to make a distinction between free speech and hate speech. Sorry, that's a very tricky question. No, I don't think it is. I think that there are some things that you can say which might class as hate speech by, by some people's definition which I think you need to be free to say, but I think it's very different when you deliberately pursue and attack individuals, and that's something that is simply intolerable and you should not be able to do. I just think it's complete. I think the point about, and the reason I think the Twitter thing is so important, and I don't do Twitter or Facebook, uh, but the reason I think the Twitter thing is so important is that people very deliberately target an individual and then they quite often use the kind of Twitter sphere as a kind of, it's like an echo chamber. So you, you say something really horrible about somebody and then somebody else who is following that person or following you sees that and so echoes it and then it goes backwards and forwards. That is not about free speech. That is about abuse. 
That is about trolling, and I think that should be stopped. Now, we, we theoretically, you, you are not... I mean, some, some forms of, of racist hate speech are not tolerated. Uh, and, and we saw what happened to Colwyn Phillips, and rightly so. But it seems to me that we need to take a much tougher line about this. And I think that, you know, here we are sitting in a university. Most students will be using Twitter and Facebook. They're bound to be. Um, in fact, actually, they probably aren't using Facebook because they're too young. They're, yeah, they're using Snapchat. I mean, it's all beyond me. Instagram. Instagram you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just getting onto WhatsApp. I'm really, really slow. But um, it's really important because they're using... that. This is, natural, this is a natural mode of communication. But it's not a mode of communication that has rules. And so I think this is about how we set rules within a, a relatively new form of communication. And so well, actually, although you say, well, what's the difference between free speech and hate speech? This is different. This is how do you conduct discourse? And what, what, and what are the fair rules of conducting discourse? And you can be robust but you can't abuse. And it seems to me that's where we have to draw the line. It's quite hard to say where that line is, but that's going to be for the judges to decide eventually. But I do think we need to legislate on this, but I don't think legislation is enough. I think we need to take a lead. I think the churches, the synagogues, the mosques need to take a lead. I think that, you know, actually, I think politicians need to take a lead. They're complaining a lot. They're saying how awful it is, but they need to say more about, and we need to do something. I, I've missed... I've heard a lot of it's terrible. I haven't heard enough, except actually, interestingly, from Margaret Hodge, who stuck it out. I haven't heard a lot of we need to do something. I think we can open it up to questions. Yeah, yes, gentlemen there. But can you wait for the microphone so that we can all hear you? Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think the, the thesis is music to, I'm sure, many people's um, ears. I, I was surprised, and I would like to ask you to comment on um, the fact that you didn't mention the people who have many followers on Twitter. There's somebody who has 6.6 .6 million followers. Oh, absolutely. Um, the real Don, Donald Trump, who repeatedly tweets in the way you described. Boris Johnson has also not been beyond tweeting in this kind of way. He has 1.2 million mm -hmm. followers. I'm surprised you didn't mention the top-down, much more the bottom-up um, problem that you, you described. Okay, well, I would say that... Um Donald Trump is responsible for quite a lot of the low standard of what happens in the Twitter sphere, but he's not responsible for this level of abuse. And that's very different. There are people who have large numbers of followers. There's a, an extraordinary ca character called Brother Nathaniel or Kapner. Bet you've never heard of him. Uh, but anyway, he has huge numbers of followers on Twitter, and he's completely vile. I mean, I think that, uh, that it is true to say that Trump and Boris Johnson and various other people have millions of followers. But the point about that is, and that, that, but that's become, and if you, if you talk to anybody who's campaigning in this election, they're doing a huge amount of their campaigning by social media, delivery of leaflets. Anybody here had a leaflet yet? No, exactly. Leaflets are going out, out of fashion. So that, if you like, has become a standard means of communication. I don't like the tone. I absolutely don't like the tone. I particularly don't like the tone of, of President Trump's sweet tweets, and some of his stuff is completely ghastly. But it's not the stuff that I'm talking about, the absolutely vicious trolling. That is something different, and it's, it's you obviously disagree, but it is something that, and there are people with large numbers of followers doing it, but it is something that's completely different, and it targets an individual to have a go at. I think that's the other thing that's really important. Thank you, that was really interesting. I just thought I would um, question your use of the word politeness. Um, and I wondered if being too polite in this country isn't partly how we got into this uh, problem in the first place. <laughs> would you like to give me an example? Well, I think for years lots of people didn't um, put, up with, put up with a whole range of sexism and racism and didn't really say anything about it in public life. And then, you know, women in particular historically mm -hmm. stood up and said, I'm not going to put up with this. And we are then experiencing a backlash to that, which is, I mean, I think if you take a whole historical view of it, that's it. I think that I think that may be right. I think that, that some of the some of the abuse targeted at women is a backlash to that. 
Um, have we been too polite? No, actually, I don't think we have been too polite. I'm not sure you really ever can be too polite. I think you can be very polite and call things out at the same time. Because I think you can say, in the most polite, possibly icy fashion, um, I've, I've, I've learned as I've got older to get more icy. I think being icy is quite effective, really. Um, but, you know, you can say to somebody that is, you know, I'm really sorry to say this to you, but that's not an acceptable way to speak. You can do that. That's perfectly polite. I hope it's devastating, but it is perfectly polite. And I actually think that those, those rules of behaviour are quite important because what if, if, and I think you're right, you know, if, you, if, if a group stands up and says it's not acceptable, so sexism is not acceptable, homophobia is not acceptable, whatever it is, anti-Semitism, whatever it is, uh, and says it's not acceptable, and shouts and screams, then in a way, they are giving in, to some extent, to the people who are being the abusers, the people who are being sexist or homophobic or whatever. Actually, you want to do it by standing up proud, standing up tall. I'm shrinking, so it's getting more difficult. But standing up tall and saying, this isn't okay but saying it very politely and coolly. I mean, I do think there's some very interesting things about, with women, I think there's some very interesting things about if you really want to call out somebody being quite sexist, it's much more effective to lower your voice and talk quietly than to shout. Now, I don't necessarily like the thinking behind that. That's all this sort of Carol Gilligan about in a different voice and sort of all of that. But I do think remaining polite while calling things out is quite important because I think if you if you sink to their level you've actually given in while we're waiting for the microphone let me ask you another question um, because I'm struck by um, how we might need to teach uh, younger generations in particular but many all generations how to speak to each other again um, what's behind this is not every, not all I mean, partly everything you've said, but also uh, recently a teacher commented that um, the four and five year olds that she is now teaching are very rude to her because they're used to speaking to Alexa. Alexa, do this, right? So there's a kind of command, no, no, no. right? So there's, uh, and there's a lack of saying please or thank you because technology is not, um, uh, the algorithm isn't going to accept please or thank you, it's going to say... <laughs> we could teach it to. We could, we could. <laughs> So I think um, that's just a, an anecdote, really. But there's yeah, a more serious question behind that, which is yeah. uh, how are we going to teach this kind of civil discourse in schools, synagogues, mosques, churches? What would you like to see? If you were ideally developing a curriculum for that, what would you want in there? I would start it very early. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the other thing that, that you didn't mention, I mean, it's very interesting about the four and five-year-olds and they're used to talking to Alexa. You could, of course, program Alexa not to do anything unless somebody said, please, Indeed. be perfectly possible, but, which I think would be a good thing, but that's a separate issue. Um, but what, you, what I think we need to do is to take children in nursery school, and there's lots of material showing that, you know, children in nursery school and in the first few years of school are not used to having proper conversations because that's not what happens at home a lot of the time. They're spending a huge amount of time on screens, but they're not sitting down, I mean, it's this thing about sitting down to a family meal or whatever, but they're not used to holding a conversation. And I think schools are going to have to take some of the role that, if you like, families used to take, grandparents clearly used to take, of actually teaching children about how you have a conversation, how you have a disagreement, what the rules are, how to be, you know, how to behave, if you like, how to disagree, but in a civilised way. And I think that is something you can teach. You, we teach it for older children in teaching them how to debate. But with younger children, I think we're going to have to teach them about how to have a conversation and how to make a point where you disagree with somebody, but you don't just shout at them. And I, I think we've lost some of those skills. Now, what I think, that's what I think school should do. I would expect churches, synagogues, mosques to do some of that. You could do that, some of that in the way that people behave within those institutions. I have to say, sometimes sitting at my synagogue council, I do wonder, and I'm sure there have been people who've been on church councils who've thought, what? Um, yes, I can see you're all nodding away. You all know exactly what I mean. 
But actually, I think that it's quite a good thing if some of us stand up and say, stop, can we, can we stop this? We can disagree, but this is not the way to do it. And we always start our synagogue board meetings with a prayer, and I know that most sort of parish councils and church councils meetings are started with a prayer. And I always think, you know, after the prayer's over for about three minutes, they've forgotten. And I think there is something about standing up and saying, do you remember what we said at the beginning? Let this be in God's name. Do you remember what we said at the beginning? That let the controversy be for the sake of heaven. Uh, and I just think that reminding people and repeating it and encouraging people, actually possibly reintroducing rules about how we do things. So one of the things that my synagogue chairman has now done is just saying, you know, each person round the board table can only speak once until everybody has spoken. Sounds very artificial, but it's not stupid. And I think there are things like that that we can do and should do, and they're small. I think the other thing I would say about this is, you know, the, this, this abuse on social media started small. You know, who knew that anybody was going to have, you know, 2 million or 10 million followers on Twitter? Nobody, nobody thought like that. Who knew that you were going to have to think about regulating all of this? It was just seen as a great freedom. Social media was seen as a great freedom. There's always a downside to new technologies, to new inventions. And I think it's about how we take this and start small, but say there are some rules around here and we're going to impose some rules around here, but we can only impose those rules on social media if we're prepared to impose those rules on how we behave more generally. And I think we could do that, but I think it requires a huge amount of what I would call public leadership. And when I say public leadership, I do mean the churches, the synagogues, the mosques, the gurdwaras, whatever. I mean the politicians. I mean the teachers and the doctors. Uh, and I mean actually the people who run the building sites. I've been very impressed. We have builders at the moment. Anybody else here got builders? Anybody else covered in dust all the time? Okay, so uh, we have builders at the moment replacing our roof, not something I would recommend to everybody, but anyway. But I have been very impressed by how the foreman speaks very courteously to the people who are working with him. And what a very different atmosphere that has created amongst the group of builders from what I've been used to at other times when we've had builders. And he's, um, he's a very committed Christian, and he has said that this is something that they've been discussing in his church, and I just think that's great and right, and it's really lovely to see and hear. Question up there. Hi. I don't want in any way at all to dismiss the terrible uh, abuse that people get on social media, but I am wondering that when the age of civility actually was, because having grown up in the 70s, it was perfectly acceptable for people to be overtly racist, sexist. In the playground, the teachers, in the classroom, jokes on television, um, and if we go back further in time, women weren't trolled in Parliament because they weren't in Parliament. <laughs> You know, I, I'm not sure when we were polite to each other. I think we were much... I, I tell you when I think we were more polite. Actually, I think, I think you're wrong about some of the 70s, maybe the, from the mid-70s on. I think when we had legislation, I mean, you, and there's, that one could argue about this, but I think when we introduced legislation that um, deliberately outlawed sex discrimination and race discrimination, not that we actually stopped it happening, or indeed people thinking it, but we said, you cannot do this. Actually, I think things did improve for a period. I think they did. I, don't, I think, first of all, certainly the racist jokes did disappear from television and radio. They did only, I mean, they only knew because you know, it, was, it wasn't acceptable and they might get sued. But okay, it may be a blunt way of doing it, but it was quite effective. It was quite effective. And I think the point that was made earlier about, you know, maybe there's a, a, a backlash and people are using Twitter to, to, to say some of the things that they couldn't say because or can't say because of the legislation, I think that may be fair. But I do think we were more civil. Actually, I think we were more civil in it just just ordinarily in the street. And I don't think I'm trying to think of. I mean, I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I don't think that my teachers made racist and sexist comments. And I think that and they, they were 
you know, often women who um, had been through the war. Um, and I think that they, long before there was any legislation, in fact, long before there was really a campaign, certainly before the mid-60s, um, they, would, they, would they would pick up on people doing things like that. So I think it depends, and I think it depends on the group. But I think people did try after the legislation came in, I think they did try. They tried possibly for the wrong reasons, but I think they did try. And I think the, the way that social media is being used and the anonymity has allowed some of those very nasty things that are not acceptable in law to reappear in a pretty unpleasant form. Ms. Vincent wants to desperately oh, say Vincent's something. Oh, Vincent's dying to ask a question. Mm -hmm. But can you wait, wait for, for the, the mic? Wait for the microphone, Vincent. It's coming. It's right here. Thank you very much for keeping us locked with the local and what we can do. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I just want to return for a minute to, to Trump. I'm, I'm sorry about this. But, <laughs> but, but, but I can't. He fills me with fear because what he does is to appear appeal to the local. Absolutely. And, and he's got fascists, sexists, biblical literalists, Christians, and, and, and you know, it's all these local things that he appeals to and, and then motivates in his movement. And, 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 and it seems this, this strikes an enormous amount of fear in, in me. Um, and I, I just wondered if you comment again on, on, on the global effect that, that, that this has. I know we can only do what we can do locally, but when it gets caught up in a movement like that, it is, is, a, is a, other than, you know, Think global, act local is, is a mantra that I, we try to follow. Um, but, but, but is there nothing but concern about the global we, we can express? I think we can express lots of concern about the global. Um, I don't think we're very effective in the UK at taking on Trump. Um, I, I mean, I think the most worrying thing about Trump, I think Trump's disgusting in all sorts of possible ways. I can't believe that you and I would disagree about that. I thought the thing that, um, I don't know whether everybody else felt this, I thought that when he said with the Charlottesville rally, the white supremacist rally, that there were good people to be found on both sides, I found that truly chilling. I found that much worse, actually, however awful the rest of it is, I found that completely terrifying, I suppose I would have to say, because it seemed to me that he was giving license to, the, to a recognition on his part of a form of virtue amongst people whose views are execrable. There's no doubt about that. So, of course, what he does and what he says and what he stands for should cause us great concern. And the fact that he uses Twitter and reaches so many people should cause us great concern. But I am more concerned, and you may tell me I'm wrong, I am more concerned about people who don't have his millions of followers, but who, and who don't put their name, at least he puts his name on his, who don't put their name on it, but absolutely bomb people with filthy abuse and I think however much I'd like to get rid of Trump um, I think that in Britain we could do something about that and I suppose in I would say I think he's ghastly I think what he does is execrable and I think the Charlottesville thing was the worst of everything I have seen but he's not anonymous. And it's the anonymity of this huge level of abuse 
and nobody, if you like, attempting to stem the tide of it that I think is so terrifying and so wrong. And so I think it is something that I would say to everybody here, we've got to do something about it. I think what I'd want to say is that the... the um can you hear me? Sorry. Um, one thing I think I'd want to say is that those things aren't separate, though. No, they're not. It is, it is absolutely apparent that yeah, there are not. many um, very influential voices, for example, the right-wing radio hosts in absolutely. America, as an example, who rile up their followers, who then are the... Uh, uh, to target someone, and then they are the anonymous tweeters that send out the message. Sure. So I think sometimes we do tend to think of the anonymous tweeters as, as lone rangers, and sometimes they are, but much of the time they're not. Mm -hmm. They are related to very large uh, uh, system structures and organizations and are inspired by uh, major public figures of this, of this kind. Mm -hmm. That is partly but only partly true, I think. And I think it's really important to recognize that it's more complicated than that because they may yes. be inspired. Some of them are inspired by these public figures, but an awful lot of them are not. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot of them, and this is what I find so terrifying about it, an awful lot of them will start off, not probably alone, and they will have listened to somebody or picked up from something, whatever. But what they do is they bat it between each other. That's when I use the term echo chamber. Mm -hmm. They bat it between each other. So it's not that they're listening to the kind of to Trump or some far right wing radio show host or uh, something, you know, we don't have so much far right wing radio stuff here or some, uh, but you don't have the, the same extent of it. But they will be listening to somebody who is BNP or whatever. They may have been doing that, but what they do then. It may have started them off. I don't, I'm not disputing that. I think they mobilise them in a very serious way, Julia, actually. I think some of them do, yep. but I also think they mobilise themselves because sure. I think there's something mm -hmm. about the way that Twitter works mm -hmm. that means that they bat it backwards and forwards time and time again, yes. and that's how they pick yes. it up. But it's, 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 it's the ball that picks yeah. up the moss. Yeah. Uh, we had one last question up there. Baroness, I want to say I enjoyed your talk very much and I liked your emphasis on individual leadership in churches, uh, synagogues and in religious communities on this question of civility in public life and in our discourse. But I was particularly intrigued by the idea of a more public nationwide campaign on this question. And I, I just thought, I was thinking that the rights that we enjoy, the right to vote, women's right to vote, brought through very big campaigning by people over many, many years and were fought for. I mean, virtually every right we enjoy. And I wonder to what extent you'd agree that perhaps in, in the last 20, 30 years we relaxed our guard. We thought with the dawning of the internet age we'd reach this new stage where all our liberal freedoms were, were taken for granted and we'd achieved them and we'd won. But in fact, we're going backwards at quite an alarming rate. And I think the Trump question is very much that, where fact, fake news becomes reality. And it's absolutely part of the same thing. But I think that I agree with you that a, a, a public campaign is needed, but it's a very difficult uh, issue to galvanise public campaigns on, and it's for regulation, as you, as you say, but it's also talking about a moral uh, change, so that I think you were right to talk about religious leaders taking this lead. Are there moves towards this? Can, I mean, is this something that we can go forward with? I don't know whether we can go forward with it because I don't know whether sufficient religious leaders have become interested in it. And actually, I, I don't think religious leaders can do it without political leaders. I think it has to be a very broad uh, grouping. I'd give you, actually, talking about the rolling back, I do think, to some extent, we did think we'd won all, that we'd won all the liberal freedoms. We'd got, you know, we'd got our rights, the human rights. It was all okay. And we did let down our guard. I completely agree with you about that. I actually am thinking about, um, does anybody here remember Charter 88 
and trying to really establish the, the need to have the European Convention on Human Rights, the, the, which, which we've been involved in writing, but in, in, into Brit in British law, in order, if you like, to make it part of our constitutional settlement and how we think. And the thing I liked about Charter 88 was that it had the most um, ill-assorted group of people involved in it. I think quite often, if you really want to win um, a campaign, you have to have unlikely bedfellows. And I would like to see this. If people, if people were going to take this seriously, you know, after an election, so awful, but you know, maybe there will be some good people return to Parliament, I hope so. And that some of those people, having been very shocked by what's happened, and indeed very shocked by the people who didn't stand this time, might get together with some religious leaders and some, uh, I would say, some local authority leaders. I mean, there are lots of people who might get involved in this. You could imagine, couldn't you? So sort of the, I mean, we're very keen on celebrities in, in, in our society, but you can imagine some leading writers and uh, actors and media personalities getting involved in this. I think you're going to need that. I don't think it can be, if religious leaders do it, they'll just say that's just them again. If politicians say, do it, they'll just say, it's self-interest. So I think it has to be a rather broad, almost sort of ragtag uh, group that takes this on. I don't, I mean, there, there are other people feeling, I think, as I do. Um, certainly, sort of having looked at all the anti-Semitism stuff and seen, you know, how that associates with misogyny, um, I think a lot of people are very bothered about that. I think we're going to need some brave politicians to take a lead on it. And then I think we're all going to have to climb on the bandwagon. But I think the more unlikely we are, the more likely it is that a campaign would work. Well, on that note, I think we should give our warmest thanks to uh, Baroness Neuberger for an inspiring speech. And we've all got our homework to do. Oh, yeah, you've got a task. Thank you. <laughs>